This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This episode is sponsored by C-School, the online school for creativity training. If you'd like to unleash your creative potential and access a free creativity blueprint training series, then just head over to c.school. That's www.c.school for your free training series. In today's episode, I speak with author and entrepreneur Eric Rees, and we talk about the lean startup, his new book, The Startup Way, and why obscurity can sometimes be a gift. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor here. I'm delighted today to be joined by Eric Reese. Eric Reese is an entrepreneur and author of the New York Times bestseller, The Lean Startup, which has sold over 1 million copies and has been translated into more than 30 languages. He serves on the advisory board of a number of technology startups, is entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School, an IDEO fellow, faculty chair at Singularity University, as well as being the founder and CEO of the Long Term Stock Exchange. His latest book is called The Startup Way, how modern companies use entrepreneurial management to transform culture and drive long-term growth. So welcome, Eric. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, it's been a very busy time for for me personally, you know, between uh, having the new book just came out and uh, and, uh, this new company, the Long-Term Stock Exchange, uh, is taken off. At the same time, uh, having... I have young kids at home, so it's uh, it's been a very interesting time. So I remember when I first moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, your book, Lean Startup, had just come out, and pretty quickly it became the Bible for a lot of tech entrepreneurs in the, te- in the startup scene there. Why do you think that book clicked with so many people at that point in time? Well, I, I wish I knew the secret. You know, I, I, I only know it from my vantage point. I think, I hope that part of it was that people, you know, that the book was helpful and that, and that was well-written and whatnot, but I think really... If we're being honest, a lot of it had to do with the timing of when the book came out. You know, when I first started talking about Lean Startup, the financial crisis had just happened. People were very hungry for new ideas about entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, I think that there was something in the air at that time that the old models were a little bit discredited and the masters of the universe didn't seem as smart as they had, you know, previously. So it was kind of an opening to bring forth something new. And I think the advantage that, uh, that I had was that I had had the chance to put some of these ideas into practice, had some terrific mentors, but had also really been given the opportunity to grapple with how these new ideas related to older ideas. So to be able to call it Lean Startup and, and build it on the theory of lean manufacturing and, and Steve Blank's customer development and, uh, you know, we spent time with Kent Beck and extreme programming and agile development, DevOps, uh, all these different theories, design thinking that were kind of in the ether at that time, but had until that moment really been used in a very siloed way to improve specific functions. This was an opportunity to say, hey, let's bring these ideas together into a kind of an enterprise-wide understanding of what we're trying to do here. And it made it made a lot of sense to start at the earliest stage of a startup to do that cross-functional collaboration. Uh, that was kind of the easiest and most natural place to to pilot it. And then once we were able to show that it worked, you know, the results speak for themselves. So then I think the a lot of the growth in the kind of second and third waves of the growth of the idea had to do with people trying the ideas and finding them useful. A lot of the ideas in that book around whether it's the idea of pivot or minimum viable product or that the actual build, measure, learn, that kind of uh, lean startup methodology was really taken on by, by a lot of entrepreneurs around the world. But I'm wondering, when did you get a sense that the lean startup was moving from being about you and your ideas to becoming more of a, a movement and a community? Yeah, that's right. That that happened actually very early, which I'm grateful for because it really helped diffuse, you know, the kind of natural ego oriented response you can have to something like this is to to think it's all about you. And and look, because luckily, you know, it wasn't it was never at no time was it really just me because there were other people writing in this area from the very beginning. I think what I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, a guy named Rich Collins called me up. He's an entrepreneur in San Francisco. And he said, I'd like to start a lean startup meetup group. Uh, and I'd like your permission to do it. And I remember talking to him on the phone. I said, listen, first of all, you don't need my permission to do it. But also, that doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. Who's going to come to a Lean Startup meetup group? You know, I was just like, uh, you know, 
go ahead, but I don't think anyone's going to show up. It seems like a terrible idea. And he's like, well, if, if I get people to show up to the first meeting, will you come speak? And at the time, it seemed like a very easy promise to make because I didn't think anyone was going to show up. So, of course, I said, sure, yeah, absolutely, people come. Well, of course, a lot of people did come, and they did the first first meeting, and, and I did a whole talk about minimum viable product. And uh, it was one of the very first of those talks that really was about that topic in particular. And so the video, uh, you know, I think got a lot of attention, and, and it helped spread the idea that there should be these lead startup meetup groups. So I did. That was not my idea, and I didn't. I didn't really especially encourage anyone to do it at first. But then people started to to create those groups in a lot of different cities, and that's and then you know, and then as I was starting to be asked to speak for a while, whenever I would go on a speaking engagement, I would also go meet the local chapter of the lean startup meetup. And, you know, in some cities it's, you know, six guys around a table and, you know, it was very informal. Uh, but in some places there'd be hundreds of people who would show up for the meeting. And I remember I was in Australia, Sydney, Australia, a place where, you know, I I'd hardly ever been in my life and, and knew very little about. And I go to the, the lean startup meetup in Sydney, Australia. There's hundreds of people in a pub uh, there to hear me speak. I give my talk. And in those days, I used to try to change my talk each time because I didn't want to be repetitive. And I felt like if I'm giving a talk, to I should give each audience something special. And then I asked for questions. The very first question from the audience was, hey, how come you didn't do that bit about, and they start to tell me about part of my talk about continuous deployment that I hadn't talked about because I had changed it. And I went up to the guy afterwards and I was like, look, what, what do you, you know, this is not a concert. I'm not here to play Freebird. Like, what, what, are you, what are you memorizing my talks on YouTube? But what are you doing? Why did you ask me that question? He said, well, the truth is I brought my whole team to this meeting because I wanted them to hear you talk about that topic. So I was disappointed that I didn't get, you know, I was, you, you were supposed to help me with something I'm trying to do in my startup. And I was disappointed. You wanted the greatest hits. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and at first I was annoyed, but then I realized something really special about it, that he was relying on me to help him spread the word. And he needed me to open that door for him uh, with his team to give him the credibility that this is a real thing. And that I remember that feeling when I was first evangelizing these ideas in my own companies and my own teams, where every once in a while, a team member would look at me and just be like, says who? You're saying we should do this crazy thing. It's different. Says who? And a lot of times I'd have to be like, what do you mean says who? You know, we're a startup. We do things our own way. Like, just let's just do it. But but I remember thinking to myself, boy, I hope one day there'll be somebody who says, says who, and I can be like, hey, how about me? <laughs> says this random guy in Silicon Valley. He says, you know, whatever. So like that, that we could get, you know, some kind of point of connection where I could use the fact of my being an external authority to help these evangelists. Uh, uh, try new things and, and encourage the skeptics on their team and just make that an easier process than it was for me. So that's when I knew. So that book sold, you know, over a million copies, been translated into 30 languages. Sure, I just got the contract for the Mongolian translation. There you go. If you're listening in Mongolia just now, there's a, there's a copy in your language. Towards the end of the Lean Startup, you asked the question, what would an organization look like if all its employees were armed with Lean Startup organizational superpowers? In your latest book, The Startup Way, you look to answer that question by essentially persuading managers at General Electric, at GE, to adopt a lean thinking methodology. So, so my question to you was like, I mean, how did that, how did that go? What was that, that process like? It was quite a wild trip. Uh, and it definitely, you know, exceeded my wildest expectations. I remember that when people would say, you know, have you ever done this in a Fortune 500 company? And I'd have to go look it up. And I'd be like, well, does Fortune 4 count? Because at the time, GE was the fourth largest company in the world. And it, and it was it was a really interesting experience. I mean, first of all, because my experiences in startups, you know, this is this was foreign terrain for me. It was a new and very stimulating environment to be working in. The people there were really extraordinary. So, you know, I was able to connect with people. And what I quickly discovered was that there were a lot of people who work there who are every bit as entrepreneurial as the kids on South of Market, you know, in San Francisco. That is that they don't have the Silicon Valley ethos. They don't. They don't look the part. They don't 
you would know from the outside that this is an entrepreneur, but you know, the, just like my dream was to build software products, you know, from when I was a kid, some of these folks, you know, their dream was to build gas turbines and aircraft engines and big heavy equipment. That's the technology that speaks to them. But until we like the democratization of the supply chain and the ability, you know, through 3D printing and, and advanced manufacturing to have, you know, people in their garage build physical equipment that has not yet extended up into the very large parts of the supply chain. So if you want to be you know a gas turbine engineer and be a pioneer in that area like it still i wouldn't say requires doing it in the context of a big company but for most people that's really the only realistic option we're just starting to see uh the first uh true entrepreneurs who are able to to access that but but that's still very much the minority so there are really entrepreneurial people working in these organizations and you know i felt like I was not a typical corporate consultant with 50 associates coming in to start a win business. I felt like that gave me a mandate and an opportunity to just kind of come in and, t and speak the truth and say, listen, here's my point of view. Here's what the theory says about how innovation happens. Here are the things that your organizational structure impedes and makes innovation difficult. Uh, and here's what you would need to do if you were serious about this. And, you know, and I've given that talk to lots of companies, um, but a few of them have taken it seriously and said, okay, let's, let's actually run the experiment. Let's try to figure out, you know, how could it, how could it work? And in the startup way, I tell the story of one of the first projects I did at GE called the series X engine. This is a diesel reciprocating platform. Uh, the, the chairman of the company at the time had chosen this as the first pilot program because he didn't want to do some software app. He really wanted to see these ideas. Were they really applicable to heavy industry? Like the, uh, the kind of, of, you know, products that GE is known for. And the conversation on the surface seems very different than you would see in Silicon Valley. The technology is, you know, it's physical. We're talking about energy efficiency and locomotive power, distributed power, you know, uh, fracking and drilling and, uh, and marine electric that is, you know, powering boats. And, and, you know, that's all new territory to me. But if you go under the hood and you look at the business plan for this new product, it's, you know, five years of stealth R&D, a $300 million investment followed by a worldwide launch, and then a beautiful, magnificent, you know, just the most amazing hockey stick shaped revenue forecast you'll ever see. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't know a diesel reciprocating platform from a toaster, but I know this graph very well, you know, step into my office, my friends. Uh, let's talk about, you know, if you really treated this project like a startup, what would that mean? What would it involve? Uh, and then when we started to have that conversation, it actually felt very comfortable. I was like, oh, this, these are my people. I know, I know what they, I know what they're going through. And so I can both empathize and give them some, some new conceptual tools that they probably hadn't considered before that could get them where they need to go. And with dealing with like a, a huge company like GE, I'm wondering in those early meetings, was there a person that you felt you really had to convince, you had to really get buy-in from them on the whole idea of the, this kind of lean startup methodology? Sure. Well, GE is so large that there's many of those people um, because you have to win over whole divisions and functions and the whole corporation. So it's a bit of a uh, it's a bit of a chess match to to get this person to get that person to get that person. Um, some of the really early champions um, are people, you know, like Beth Comstock, who at the time was the CMO and was the original instigator to have me come in and meet then the CEO Jeff Immel. But pretty quickly, they formed a kind of five person, almost like a board of directors for the transformation that encompassed, you know, the head of global research, effectively the CTO, the CIO, the CMO, head of HR uh, and head of finance. And those that group together kind of touches enough of the organization that they became the key allies. And it's interesting because there's been this change of leadership at GE. And if you look at who's been promoted into the new jobs, a lot of those initial uh, advocates uh, are now in really important positions, uh, positions of power, like Jamie Miller, uh, who was on that committee, is now the CFO. Um, and they've just appointed for the first time a chief innovation officer. So, uh, And the new CEO was at the time that we started FastWorks, that's what they called it at GE, you know, he was uh, he was in one of the divisions and was one of the really early advocates for adopting uh, FastWorks, both first in a global context and then later uh, in the healthcare business. So, so it's been cool to see the ideas kind of get embedded into the organization, even as they go through this leadership transformation. 
So the whole build, measure, learn that that uh, lean startup methodology was a kind of circular kind of route, and it's kind of it's a kind of iterative um, process as well. But I'm wondering, as you were starting to work with these larger organisations, did you get a sense that there was something in order to kind of complete that circle, something that actually startups could learn from these larger organizations so something that those people who are, who are starting those new businesses in their garages can learn from the ge's of this world you got it that actually is the reason i wrote the book is that i originally thought the book was going to be about lean startup as it applies to big companies but what was funny is that even as i was doing that work you know with the ge's of the world toyota into it you know you name it i was also being asked by entrepreneurs who when they first encountered Lean Startup, you know, when they came to an early Lean Startup meetup, maybe they were five founders in a garage. But now they've hit product market fit. Now they have 500, 1,000, 5,000 employees. And they were starting to hit problems that are surprisingly similar to the problems I was facing at GE. And so I would actually was working with a number of those companies as well to try to help them stay innovative and maintain that, that startup DNA as they scaled. And a lot of them, and I, I had the says who problem again. They'd say, well, sure, I can see how this worked when we were in the garage, but you know, how is this going to work when we get to, Oh, you know, to a thousand employees, boy, I don't know. I don't know if it can really work at a thousand employees. And I'd be like, well, gee, has 300,000 employees. So actually uh, there's something there. And, and what I eventually realized is that although these companies are so different on the surface, there's one's five years old, one's, you know, 125 years old. Uh, one has a thousand employees. One has hundreds of thousands of employees. One has, you know, a billion, one has a billion users. The other has, you know, hundreds of billions of revenue, like it's, they're very different. If you actually look at how the companies are structured internally, they're very similar. The management systems, the financing systems, the uh, functional silos, we're building to a very common blueprint that has been in, in effect in the business world for about a hundred years. And so if you build to the same structure, you have the same problems, no matter how old you are. And that brings me all the way back to the garage, because then what my realization was kind of my mission has been with this book and with, you know, with my work of late is to say, actually, if we're going to build the next generation of companies and avoid these kind of mistakes of the past, we don't want our companies to become bureaucratic and lethargic. We want them to stay dynamic and we want them to be able to do continuous innovation, you know, all the way through their life, then we have to plant the seeds of that way of thinking surprisingly early in the company's life. Because when you go through hyper growth, hyper growth, you know, from, from through product market fit, that really is a kind of a transformation, just like when we transform, you know, the org chart of, of one of these big companies. But it's, it's a transformation where almost all the new people that you bring into the company come from the outside. They come from big companies. They come from their students. They come from you know other large organizations. They, they, they're not very likely to come from other hyper growth startups just because that's not who's, you know, that's who's hiring. So you bring all this big company DNA into your precious startup and you're surprised when it starts to slow down and get lethargic. So we have to, we can't build the tree before product market fit, but we can plant the seeds of that new way of working, that new better blueprint, so that when we go through hyper growth, when we do find success, we build the kind of organization we can be proud of. So you're a parent now, but you're also working day in, day out with these very innovative companies, both large and small. And obviously you're seeing all the changes in terms of the future of work with artificial intelligence and automation and, and robots. So I'm kind of wondering, what advice are you giving to your, to your, you know, your own children around how to ensure that they they continue to foster their creativity, even if they're not going to necessarily be entrepreneurs and start businesses? But what kind of lessons are you teaching them in terms of ensuring that they keep that creative uh, sense of themselves and that curiosity in themselves? Well, it's really interesting. This this has really changed my perspective being a parent. Um, you know, and my kids are very young, so they're not. We're not yet having career conversations or anything like that. Uh, thank goodness. But one thing that I, you know, this is almost a point of cliche, but now I understand what people mean by it. And I, and I actually see this in corporate settings too. Like, I think it's very easy given the way that we have built our organizations in the 20th century to lose sight of the fact that people are intrinsically creative and that like an accomplishment of the 20th century management revolution was to get people uh, acculturated to pretend otherwise at work. 
like I think most people are actually asked to leave their creativity behind when they come into the office, which I think is a real, uh, a true, true, true shame. And and having kids, you really see it, like the the curiosity, the inventiveness, the playfulness, the kind of willingness to take risks and to kind of uh, turn failure into learning. Like those are intrinsic birthrights of all of us. We we all have it, and so the challenge, you know, is not so much how do we teach kids to be creative, but actually how do we prevent the world from uh, grinding that spark out of them? You know, to mix metaphors, I guess. It's like that Picasso quote where he says, you know, every child is born an artist, and the challenge is how to remain an artist when they grow up. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I guess you know when this relates to kind of entrepreneurship and and business. You know, so many uh, adults when they grow up and they go into leave college and they go into organizations, maybe large organizations, and their their creativity's kind of been crushed out of them. They've kind of lost a little bit of that sense of that curious curiosity, that that what if um, kind of mindset. Yeah, and not not sometimes. I, I would say almost all the time. So I, I had a really interesting meeting recently at the American Ballet Theater. They have an innovation program. I talk about an old fashioned old organization. You know that. And I can't remember how many decades they've been around. You know, it's an artistic organization, a nonprofit. It has a huge, excuse me, it has a huge board. I mean, people talk about tradition in an artistic context. It has even more weight than when we talk about it in a business context. And yet they have found ways to uh, use their creative work to to kind of get people thinking in a new way. And they even uh, sometimes will do workshops for a business audience where they'll show people a little bit of the creative process and the, you know, the dance choreography the interplay between the choreographer and the dancers, you know, to people who have never really experienced how dance or really how any kind of art is made and use that to draw lessons uh, for them to think about in a business context. And when I, you know, when you talk to business people about that and say, are you going to learn something about business from a ballet? They're just like, Oh my God, you know, give me a break. Right. But actually when they do these events, it's really surprising the connections that people make. And what they told me was that the most common thing that happens is not that people say, oh, I'm going to use that ballet technique in my work, but rather the sense of inspiration and kind of fluidity that they experience in watching the art made makes them realize that there's some creative project at work that they're not doing that with. You know, they're afraid to fail or they're not willing to speak up or they're, you know, they're worried about what people will think. And so they're not, they're not bringing their full creativity to work. And then they go, you know, they go back to the office and they give it a try. And and that's so, so what's so remarkable to me is I feel like that's true for almost every person I meet in any kind of business context. We all have these ideas. And then we have these fears that prevent us from from speaking up. And so I think as we start to see work like 21st century work as so dependent on creativity as a, as a natural resource that's too precious to be squandered. I think then that will give us, I hope the courage to risk embarrassment, to risk failure, to risk, you know, our peers not understanding it uh, in the service of bringing those ideas forward. We our, our modern organizations need that creativity to thrive. That's, that's in an age of automation. That's the reason to employ human beings in the first place. And you mentioned that fear. I know a lot of friends of mine who are authors, they love the the quiet work of writing and the, the research around writing a new book. But they, some of them are now also thinking about kind of getting up on stages and speaking and using speaking as a way of spreading their, their ideas. Now, I know you speak around the world um, to associations, to, to corporations about the ideas in, in your book. Any advice that you would give to maybe those uh, those authors, those people out there who are thinking about getting up on stage and becoming speakers and using that as a way to spread their ideas? I don't know. I don't. Speaking doesn't come very naturally to me. Uh, I'm very introverted, and I find the process uh, nerve wracking. For me, I'll just say what ha- helped for me, and and I hope that maybe others will will find this useful. One of the very first times I was asked to give a truly big speech, you know, with a big audience, with you know, I think it had seven or 800 people, uh, in the audience, uh, which I I was, you know, very big for me at the time. I was so nervous that I wasn't sure I could carry through it. And I, you know, and you gotta, you find me in the bathroom, you know, backstage before the event. And it it wasn't like sick to my stomach, but I was nervous and lightheaded and, and being like, Oh boy, what have I gotten myself into? And I had to really look myself in the mirror and say, why am I doing this? Like, okay, it's time to get down to brass tacks. Like, why am I really here? 
is it to seek fame and fortune? Is it that I hope that these people will, you know, like I was like, let's be serious about this. What am I going to be on TV and become a celebrity? Like, why am I here? What is the point of it? And I really had to sit there and be honest with myself and say, you know, I didn't get into this for fame. I didn't get into this because, you know, I hope to make a lot of money as a public figure. And then I was like, why did I even get into the technology industry in the first place? And I really had to go all the way back to like, what have been my motivations that had taken me to that point? And I was thinking about, all right, I really got into this because I believe the kind of technology products that, that I was building at that time, you know, that, that we, that we're trying to create in this industry can have this positive effect and can change the world. Like I really o- always felt the sense of mission and power that comes with this new generation uh, of technologies. That's always, you know, appealed to me since I was a kid. And yet most of the time that I've actually tried to build those products, they were fun to build, but nobody used them. So the sadness, the loss the failure of building something that nobody wants, that having it go out into the world and not have any impact because although the technology was great, you know, the customers didn't read the darn business plan. That's a pain that I wish someone had spared me. It's, it's so profound. If you've never been through it, it's just like it's so unpleasant. And I was thinking to myself, okay, in this audience today, yeah, there might be 800 people here, but I bet you there's one entrepreneur who's about to be in that situation And if I can help that one person prevent that from happening by saying something useful to them, then that's totally worth it. That's worth a few minutes of embarrassment. It's worth the risk of the talk going badly and the fact that I might trip and fall on the stage or whatever. But I'll just focus on helping that one person and whatever else happens, happens. And that's what allowed me to get through those early, very fearful moments around public speaking. And as we start to finish up here, if you could recommend just one book to our listeners and also one album, what would they be? Well, the album is easy because you should you should basically have Hamilton on twenty four seven on repeat until you can uh, sing the whole thing, you know, without thinking. That's I think that's an essential part of cultural literacy in the twenty first century. And and if you don't find that inspiring, I don't know what's wrong with you. For books, it's harder because uh, there's so many great books and um, there's so much going on now. I'll just mention one that that really I found uh, inspiring and fun to read. There's this book called The Woman Who Smashed Codes. And it's about uh, one of the very first cryptographers uh, who helped invent the field with her husband uh, in the early 20th century. I mean, we're talking about World War I. And then you know, she was instrumental in the creation of the NSA and, and all of modern signals intelligence owes an int- incredible debt to her. And then after uh, World War II, she she was instrumental in cracking all these Nazi codes. If you know the famous story about about the cracking of Enigma and Alan Turing and that whole thing, right? So so she cracked Enigma by hand without a computer or a calculator or any kind of mechanical aid. She did it with her brain, which I didn't previously even know was possible for a human being to do. It's such a feat. For those who don't know the, what's involved, this is a feat of mathematical prowess that uh, is be hard for anyone to rival in history. And then after the war, she was systematically erased from history by the men who took over the field and who built these institutions. So it's like a classic case of, uh, of misogyny uh, erasing this incredibly brilliant woman. And then a journalist, actually a journalist here in the Bay Area, recently, a couple years ago, uncovered her papers and was able to recreate her story and bring it to life. And just like, A, it's a wonderful biography because it's just such an interesting, her name was Elizabeth Friedman. She lived this incredibly interesting life. But it's also so interesting because right now we're going through this whole like ridiculous debate about whether women are good at math and whether, you know, computer science should be, be all men or what, as if there was some kind of natural law to this. And it's like, well, actually this, you know, none of us are at her level, you know? So, so she was like, it was not an accident. You can't say, well, she didn't have natural ability. Like she had the natural ability. She did the work and then was uh, systematically erased so that we would have this debate about are women actually good at this or not instead of uh, having the debate about what is our complicity uh, in this systematic erasure. And if you've seen, yeah, if you've seen the movie Wonder Woman, I'll say one last thing about this. You, see, you saw Wonder Woman? You wonder what, so I mean, a great movie, right? But I, I watched Wonder Woman while I was reading this book and I was like, this movie is totally unrealistic. 
And I said it to someone, and they're like, well, duh. I mean, this is a way, <laughs> of course, unrealistic. She can like punch a building and it explodes. Like, what do you mean? I was like, no, 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 not that far. Of course, the, the physics are unrealistic. But also, she's like repeatedly in World War I in these room full of powerful men, and they're all totally fine with her like exhibiting leadership and strength. And they like, they're basically fine with it through the whole movie. And it's like, we know that's unrealistic because Wonder Woman actually lived. She was alive in World War One. Her name was Elizabeth Friedman, and the men around her systematically erased her. They were not fine with it. So uh, I felt like that was an important book for us to, to read and grapple with. Well, I know we have a lot of uh, filmmakers who are listeners to the podcast as well, so maybe there's a someone wants to pick up that uh, and make that into a film. This is going to be an incredible film adaptation. Please, somebody get right on it. So a final question for you, Eric. Let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. You've got all the tools of your trade, all the knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you, you know no one. What would you do? How would you restart? This is going to sound crazy, but that sounds so fun. I mean, I, I, I maybe I'm a sick kind of a person, but like, to, to, like obscurity is such a gift because you can try stuff and no one cares whether it succeeds or fails. And you can just, you can, so many great technologies and great products start as a toy that no one takes seriously. You can like revel in that and really go nuts with it. So like, I have so many startup ideas that like, I wish I had the time and bandwidth to pursue, but I feel obligated, you know, to, to do the work that I, that I do that as of you as my main job. So to be able to really like dive into one of those projects and kind of see where it took me, uh, I think would be incredibly fun. So your latest book, The Startup Way, How Modern Companies Use Entrepreneurial Management to Transform Culture and Drive Long-Term Growth is out now. What is the best way for people if they want to connect with you, learn more about some of these projects, the, the Lean Startup Methodology and the other things that you've got going on? Sure, sure. So I maintain separate web pages for all the parts of my life. So the startupway.com. Uh, there's an entire uh, education program and, and company called Lean Startup Labs that's at leanstartup.co. We put on conferences uh, and, and do all kinds of education uh, podcasts and, and videos and stuff so people can learn more about Lean Startup at leanstartup.co. And the long-term stock exchange is at ltse.com. Well, Eric, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today and learning about some of the ideas that are in your new book, The Startup Way, and also getting that wonderful book recommendation. Uh, I hope we get a chance to, to meet in person at some point on some stage somewhere in the world. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing the story of your creative life. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.